Hello, everybody. It's Jeremy Myers here. Hey, listen, Logos Bible Software version 8 is out today. So I'm going to give it a test run here. And you can um, get a discount by going to redeeminggod.com slash logos. Okay. When you type in that, it's going to take you over here to the special Logos 8 offer for readers of redeeminggod.com. You get 10% off the base package or 25% if you are upgrading. And just use the Redeeming God 8 at checkout to get that. Okay, so what I'm going to do is sort of go through my review of Logos Bible Software version 8. I'm sorry, version 7. And I'm not going to go through all of the 13 positives and 6 negatives, but a few of them just to see how Logos 8 stacks up. All right, see if they've made any good changes uh, and anything that uh, might have made the software better. Now, I do use Logos Bible Software for my Bible study, for the books that I write, and especially for the podcasts that I teach. Eventually, I'll be putting out some commentaries as well on, let's see, they're written on Genesis 1, 2, 3, and 4. I have a commentary written on Esther, a commentary written on the book of Jonah, a commentary written on Ephesians, and... A commentary written on 1 Corinthians. <laughs> so, uh, but none of them are published yet. Uh, but I did use Logos Bible Software and uh, earlier versions, so I'm excited to see what Logos Bible Software 8 does. Now, the very first complaint I had about Logos Bible Software 7, right here, negative number one, was the startup time. This made me so frustrated. There was often times where I wanted to open my Bible study and use it for something, but I just knew I just needed a quick search for a Bible reference or something, and it took forever for Logo 7 to open up. So I would just go to the internet, open up my Google Chrome browser, and search for it that way because it was that much quicker. I hope they've changed that for Logos Bible Software 8. Let's try it. I'm going to go down here to my icon and click it. Instant click. Let's see what happens. Uh, you know what? That's pretty fast. It's still sort of loading here. Okay, you know what? That is pretty much just as fast as opening up my browser. I am happy with that. Faith Life, Logos Bible Software, thank you so much for fixing that loading time. I hope that uh, it continues to be that fast as I continue to use the software going forward. Okay, so just my initial impressions here of Logos Bible Software 8. I've never been a fan of their home screen. It always seems too busy and full of advertisements as well. Here, I guess they're also putting links to their blog. Again, I'm not a big fan of that. If I want to subscribe to their blog, I'm going to use a reader or something. But whatever. I do like, okay, I do like they have some tutorials here. You know what? Frankly, I would like more tutorials. I would just like a list of tutorials on here right from the start. In fact, maybe that's what this is. This quick start videos for Logos 8 with Morris Proctor. That looks pretty good. So if you're a brand new user, oh, this looks fantastic. If you're a brand new user of Logos, I would recommend you probably go through some tutorial studies uh, just like what they have here. Uh, let's just close some of these out, go back home, because there is a bit of a learning curve for Logos Bible software, but that's true with anything you use, right? First time you got a cell phone, uh, first time you got to a job, first time you drive a car or... <laughs> Uh, as you're learning to drive a car. Okay, there's a learning curve, and that's going to be the same thing with using Logos Bible Software. So that's good. Uh, start off with some, I like these tutorial videos right at the beginning. Other than that, let's just see what else we've got going on here. We have this dashboard thing here. This is sort of new. Use the plus button to add cards to keep track of your reading plans, prayer lists, workflows, and more. Okay, you know what? This is a feature of Logos Bible Software that I've never used and I've never liked. I don't use it for reading plans, prayer lists, workflows, none of that sort of thing. So I'm not sure how helpful. I just use it to study the Bible. That is it. All right. So I, I guess we could see here. All right. There's courses, devotion, daily devotionals. I don't use those. Layout, uh, lectionary, prayer list, read. Okay. I, I'm honestly, Logos, I'm not going to be using any of that. So again, if, if you do, though, I imagine if you like to keep track of prayer lists and things like that, um, you know, and have a daily Bible reading plan, then maybe Logos will be helpful for you. By the way, let me just flip back over here. Let's just go down 
Yeah, here's my video. You can see if you want to go compare, I have a YouTube video here about how quickly, slowly, Logos Bible 7 used to load. Logos Bible software review, negative two cost. Yes, I do admit it is still quite expensive. You can get 10% off or 25% of upgrading by using the Redeeming God 8 at checkout, but it's still going to be fairly expensive. Let's go down here and see what some of the packages are. I'm using the gold package, I'll just let you know right now. And that price is $1,394.99. So it's not cheap. But Bible study is what I do for a living. And so that is important for me. Now, I do get a lot of resources that go along with that. And it does speed up my Bible study process. So that's helpful. But I'd recommend, now that has a lot of commentaries and Bible study things. Um, ultimately, I would have liked the Platinum one because it has more Greek and Hebrew level type studies. Um, but uh, Starter, Bronze and Silver, if you're just getting started, one of those might be fine for you as well. Okay, so anyway, it is still quite very expensive. And not only that, but the books are expensive. This is probably... Uh, oh, by the way, when you do use this, you do get a bunch of these free starter books. You get a commentary on Genesis by John Skinner, $38 value, a book on the atonement, right? How to study the Bible, R.A. Torrey, great preacher, teacher, professor from the past, Spurgeon, of course, and some of these other books. All of these you'll get for free as well when you use my coupon code RedeemingGod8 at Logos. But aside from that, if you were to go over to the store, and let's just uh, browse all here. The books themselves are still quite expensive. Okay, like I have this book, Michael Heiser, The Unseen Realm. All right, Recovering the Spiritual Worldview of the Bible. They're selling it here. It's just a digital file that comes downloaded into your logos. $25. I'm not sure how much it is over on The Unseen Realm. I got my caps lock on there. Let's turn that off. Here it is, The Unseen Realm. Look, you can buy the hardcover book over on Amazon for $19. The Kindle, you can get for six bucks. Doesn't look like they have a paperback version of it. Okay, it would be somewhere between six and $19. I'm guessing about, you know, 13, 14 bucks. But Logos, for a digital file that you're downloading, they're charging you 25 bucks. Logos, you've got to fix this. You've got to compete with the digital prices over on Amazon. I'm sorry if that cuts into your profits and the royalties that you can pay your authors, but you've got to compete with Amazon. You have to, okay? At least make it around the same price as the hardcover book. People like me, I prefer to study using paper. I like to underline, highlight, write notes in the margins, okay? Dog ear the pages, I like to do that. And so you have to incentivize me to buy additional books. So. I'll be honest, I, uh, there's been only one or two books that I have actually bought for my Logos Bible software. I love all of the books that come in the package. I'm happy to pay for it because of the speed and ease that the software gives to me. But And I'm happy to take the books that come with it and use them. But because of the expense of buying the books on the Logos Bible software website, I almost never get one. All right, so, and here's another one. I have this one. This is a great book as well. I use it all my time. In fact, it's sitting over here, just about five feet from my, from my hands here. Let's just go see how much this one is. It was 30, what was it? It was $60 at, at uh, Logos here on Amazon. It's $46.38. That's for the hardcover version. All right, so again, Big drawback here. That is still true. Uh, uh, but I am on the Logos Bible Software, the Faith Life email newsletter, and there's a free book that they send out every month, so I make sure I download that. So if you do get the Logos Bible Software, make sure you sign up for their newsletter to get notified about the free book every month, whatever that is. I don't always get it if I don't want it, but often they're very good Bible study resources, commentaries and things, theology books even, things like that, which then I can add to my library. All right, let's see. Let's go back to my review. Uh, negative number three, too many resources. Uh, I don't know if that's actually a negative too much. That's sort of a positive. It's better to have too much than not enough, right? And uh, it is. it can be overwhelming, though. 
So if that's an issue for you, something to be aware of, aware of don't, don't get bogged down in all the books and resources that they have. Just uh, go and look for what you want and then get it if you're going to pay for it. All right. Uh, it's hard to use. It is hard to use. Okay. Hopefully they fix some of that in Logos 8. In fact, let's just go look. All right. Logos 8. One of the problems I had with using Logos 7 is figuring out how to actually use it. Thankfully, they have the videos. But let's just see. If I wanted to search, let's say I wanted to do a study on Genesis 1.1. All right, first of all, much faster. Thank you again, Logos. This took forever under Logos 7. Um, but look, okay, I can open the passage. It's very well organized here. I like that. It tells me I can search for it in a particular Bible translation. I wonder why they're showing me the New Revised Standard Version here. Um, I wonder how I can change that. Because I'm not a... I mean, I like the New Revised Standard Version, but I'm more of a New King James Version myself. Right-click. Um, I guess I could change it here. Okay, so when I clicked on it, I could go down and click. Let's go find... Uh, whoa, okay, look at all these. Oh, my. All right, New King James. Let's go find the New King James. There it is, New King James. Okay, so now it's saying in... Genesis 1.1 in the New King James Version. I guess I could click on that. What happens here? Fuzzy Bible search, Bible results. I don't want a fuzzy search. I want to see Genesis 1.1. Uh-oh, Logos. <laughs> this should not be this hard. I just want to open up Logos Genesis 1.1. I tell you, Bible software should be intuitive. Let's try this again. I'm going to get rid of that. I'm going to search just, forget all these other things down below. I'm going to search just for Genesis 1-1 and see what, ha see what happens. All right, so when I put in just Genesis 1-1, it opens up. But again, look at this, in the New Revised Standard Version. I don't want that. I want the New King James. How can I change that? Multiple resources view. I'm not seeing any way to right-click on that. Um, I'm actually not seeing any way to change my Bible translation. Interlinear options, that's cool. What is this? Okay, table of contents for the Bible. I mean, that's helpful, but again, I want to change. All right, look, I don't want to waste your time watching this video, but this is a problem for me right off the bat. I don't see anywhere to change. I, I could do a Google search, I suppose. How to change the, the default Bible translation for Logos 8, but you'd think it would be easier. Let's try it one more time. Did I miss something? Look, if you're watching this video and you know how to do this. All right, maybe I can just go... All right, where was that? L M. They should have all these organized a little bit better, I think, too. They don't really seem to be. There it is, New King James. Save. Save. Okay, whatever. All right. Okay, so now they're showing me New King James and over here, New Revised Standard. But what if I... All right, can I... Um... Can I get rid of... And look, there's no way to get rid of the New Revised Standard. All right, look, I'm not going to waste any more time. I'm confused by this. I want to change the default Bible search translation, and I don't know how. So that's a problem for me, But uh, and I'm actually fairly annoyed by that. Um, maybe, maybe there's a quick start video on how to do that, but I'm not going to, again, not going to waste your time. I feel like it should be obvious. There's, there's got to be something here that I'm missing. Tools, maybe? What are these? Okay. Uh, look, this must be something new in these guides. Okay, also something new. Uh, I'm not seeing anything about changing my default Bible translation. Maybe in my settings? No, <laughs> this, is just, this is just how many columns I want to show. 
help. That might be good. Video tutorials. All right. Again, I'm, I'm not seeing anything. Quick start layouts. All right. Who knows? Let's move on. That's a frustration. I'm going to move on. Let it go, Jeremy. Let it go for now. <laughs> All right, uh, let's go check out these guides. That was interesting. I wasn't sure what this is. I think this is something new for Logos 8. I like what I see here. I'm not sure what it is. Let's try one. Okay, let's say I wanted to do a Bible word study. Right now I am teaching an online course as part of my discipleship group called the Gospel Dictionary. It looks at 52 keywords of the gospel. One of them, for example, the one I've been studying on recently is the word fire. Let's just see what we can find out here. We're doing a Bible word study on the word fire. All right, this looks pretty cool, I must say. First, we have the English definition, which of course is helpful. Then we have various, we have the uh, Evangelical Dictionary of Biblical Theology. I have that in hardback, but it's nice. It's I don't have to open it. It's just a few feet from my shoulder here. Uh, and a bunch of other, the not, Naves topical, again, I have that, but it's nice, it's right here, easy. To, oh, and then look at this, okay, then we get into the Hebrew and the Greek. Oh, and a beautiful little chart about uh, which words are translated. Oh, and then where they're found throughout the Old Testament as well. That is extremely helpful. The different words that get translated as fire, broken up by their percentages in a nice little pie chart. And the Hebrew word with their translation, their meaning, right underneath it. And the same for the Greek. Okay, that is really cool. And then even phrases, how the word is found in various phrases. Um, lemma in passage, all commentaries, no results. Okay, textual searches. So... This is more like a concordance section down here. All right, so this is very helpful. This is going to get me started in seeing the various words uh, that are used in the Hebrew and the Greek, where they're found in the Bible. This is the Greek. Oh, yeah, the Greek has that too, 78 times, and it shows how they are distributed throughout the New Testament. All right, so obviously that's not going to help me. Uh, that just doesn't do the study for me, but that just saved me a whole lot of time looking all of this up in dictionaries and encyclopedias and concordances, turning to all of these passages, seeing which Greek and Hebrew words get translated as fire and how they're used in this various context. It looks to me like I can load them all up right here. And uh, even, uh, now again, I wish they had the New King James down here. How can I fix that? Okay, this is really going to bother me. Uh, I'm going to have to email someone at Logos or something and, and get this figured out. Uh, so, okay, so that's the word study. That's very, very cool. Let's see these other guides. What else do we have here? Passage guide. Okay, I in my one verse podcast, I tend to prefer to teach through books of the Bible. Um, I've taught through Genesis 1, 2, 3, and 4, and Jonah so far. Right now, we're sort of doing a topical thing based on the gospel, but let's just see if I wanted to do a... All right, look at this. I just started typing in Jonah, and we see sort of a nice outline here. For the book of Jonah, I wonder who came up with this outline. Jonah tries to run away from God. Notice it's not in order. Jonah is reproved. This is from Jonah 4. What? It's, it's not in uh, Jonah 1, then we have 1, 1, then we have 3, then back to 1, 1, 1. Okay, it's not in order, but whatever. We can look through it a little bit. Psalm of Thanksgiving. Let's just click on that because I disagree with that heading. All right, I clicked on it. Okay, and... Initially, nothing was happening, but now it's now it's populating. All right, so nice. It pulls up some commentaries that I have available that I can read on those. Let's just click on one. IVP Bible Background Commentary. I used this one as part of my research. Yeah, so this is uh, from the IVP Bible Background Commentary. And they call it a prayer of thanksgiving, of course. I don't think it was. I think it is a selfish prayer of Jonah where he puffs up himself, shows his spiritual pride and condemns the sailors and the people of Nineveh and everybody all on this one prayer. But uh, you'll have to listen to my podcast 
to see my explanation of Jonah chapter 2. And uh, anyway, give some nice background. Okay, so that's good. What else do we have? Journals, no results. Uh, okay, parallel passages, treasury of scripture knowledge. Again, it's a helpful tool, but not one of my favorites. Important passages. Yes, uh, Psalm uh, Jonah 2 has a lot of references, allusions to the Psalms and other passages from scripture, especially the Psalms. So it looks like this is a nice uh, the important passages is pointing some of these out. Important words, okay, also very nice. Gives me some important words in the chapter. Their frequency, and so on. I wonder what this little chart means. I don't really know what that means. Little green circle thing, but whatever. Oh, some maps. That's helpful. Very, very helpful. It's always nice when you're studying a passage to see where it takes place geographically. So pulling this up here. Well, I'm just using my mouse to uh, sort of scroll out a little bit. So, of course, Jonah got on a boat at Joppa here and wanted to head over across the Mediterranean. Do, 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 do the edge of the known world and looks like the map stops i can't go that far it's out this way on the edge of spain over there all right and he was supposed to go to nineveh which is over here anyway sort of helpful not the best map for this part of jonah but uh maybe if we click on jonah's travels ah here we go so got on a boat at joppa apparently they're saying the boat went this way I'm not sure how they know that maybe that's just what they did and then they're saying that probably the the fish swallowed him in here, spit him up on dry land here, and then he walked from there all the way to Nineveh. Again, I, I don't know how they know that. There's no indication in the text. Why couldn't the fish have spit him up over here somewhere? Maybe it's the depth of the water or something. Who knows? Anyway, very interesting, helpful little map. Uh, and you could, if you're teaching this, you could you could take a screenshot of this, maybe copy this. Can I copy? Yeah, it looks like I can copy this image. And um, I could send it to PowerPoint. Very cool. If you're making PowerPoint presentations for a sermon or a Bible study, you can just take this image right out of here and send it right over to your PowerPoint presentation. Very, very nice. In fact, along with the maps, I think I saw some other pictures down here. There were See, look at this. Some pictures you could probably do the very same thing with some of these pictures. All right, so let's, I don't know what some of these pictures are. These are just of the Mediterranean Sea, I guess. Here we have some pictures of Jonah and the fish from ancient times, some of the uh, other archaeological drawings, coins, and so on from that time, and a bunch of other outlines. All right, so look, passage guide, very, very helpful. What else can we try here? Let's close some of this out here. Close that. Close that. Guide. Okay, we did passage guide. Let's do one other. Uh, da, 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 da. Let's do a theology guide. Oh, okay, this is interesting. Theological topic. Let's study something very basic, but which most people do not understand. Salvation. All right, it looks like I wasn't really paying attention there when I typed that in. Let's try that again. All right, so when I type in salvation, it gives me some options. Spirit, Jesus' accomplishment, the Spirit's application, the permanence of salvation, the Holy Spirit and salvation. Hmm. A lot more topics about salvation than those four. I wonder why. Let's try the permanence of salvation because I'm interested to see what Logos says about this. All right, so they're using the Lexham Survey of Theology. This is some resources put out by Logos itself. And I'm seeing this sort of falls under Holy Spirit and Salvation section. That's fine. Okay. I disagree with them. <laughs> um, this is from Lexham. The early church believed final salvation. Again, I don't like that term. 
Salvation in the Bible does not refer to going to heaven when you die. So don't talk about it. They're, they're trying to clarify what they mean by final salvation by saying going to heaven when you die. So just talk about eternal life maybe or glorification or something. But anyway, I get what they're trying to do by adding that word final. They recognize that the word salvation means a bunch of different things in the Bible. So they're trying to clarify that. Okay, was conditional upon faithfulness of the believer. That is not true. All right, um, and I imagine you can click on faithfulness and get a study on that, yeah. Uh, faithfulness of the believer. You receive eternal life by believing in Jesus Christ for it, period. <laughs> All right, once you believed in Jesus for eternal life, you have eternal life. And if eternal life can be lost, it has the wrong name. Eternal life is eternal. All right, so um, it does not depend on your ongoing faithfulness. It depends entirely upon Jesus Christ and his faithfulness, and he will never lie. He will never leave you. He will never forsake you. We should be faithful. We should follow and obey Jesus, but not so that we can go to heaven when we die. That's a works-based gospel. We should be faithful and follow and obey Jesus because that allows us to live the best life possible now with the greatest benefits for our, our health and our relationships and our finances and our jobs and everything, and our witness and everything else God wants for us. But anyway, okay, so that was one sentence. First sentence off of salvation, I disagree. Uh, this is why the issue of post-baptismal sin, post-baptismal sin, come on. Um, <laughs> what are we talking about here? Spirit baptism, water baptism, you know, baptism with fire. Okay, that's a very unclear statement as well. If baptism was required to wash away sins, what are they talking about water baptism here? Water baptism doesn't do anything for washing away your sins. Um, but baptism was a one-time event. What recourse did those people have who sinned afterwards? Now, I understand they are trying to summarize some of what the early Christians taught in the early church. But this statement does not summarize what all of the early church fathers taught. Many of the early church fathers taught something else. Okay, so there was some debate. So I wish they would have sort of pointed that out here. Um, oh, some church leaders, on the basis of Hebrews 6, 4 through 8, interpreting enlightenment as baptism, believed that such people could not be saved. Very difficult passage, Hebrews 6, 4 through 8. I have taught about it on my podcast, on my blog. I will be teaching about it again. And so on and so forth. Okay, the point is, eh, it's going to be fairly typical theology. You have to read it with a grain of salt. You have to read it with some understanding that just because some expert, some PhD here wrote this, you don't have to agree with everything they wrote. I disagreed with three or four things in just that very first paragraph, especially how they are summarizing what the early church believed. No, some people in the early church believed that, not all. All right, that means that, and some people today believe that, but not all. All right, I don't believe what uh, is said in the, the very first two lines or so of, of, that, of that statement. Anyway, okay, interesting here. We have a theology guide, which use, can be used to help you study some topics. Let's move over to these tools. Just see what some of these tools are real quickly, then we'll be done. All right, it looks like a lot of these are what they already had in Logos 7. So you can go look at the Atlas, you can look at some facts, you can... Faith Life Assistant. Um, ooh, maybe that's going to help me figure out how to change my default Bible translation. I'll, I'm going to do that last. I'm going to hold it to last. I'm still stuck on that. Highlighting, okay, media, pictures, and so on, notes. All right, that's going to that's gonna be helpful. What's this workflow editor? That's interesting. Did I see that over here? I think I did. Workflows. Huh. Look at this. Are those the same thing? Let's go down. Just go. The tools are the same thing they had in Logo 7, so I'm not going to say much about that. Uh, guides. Let's go check the one of these workflows. Uh, da -da 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 I don't know. Uh, let's do a basic Bible study. Enter a Bible reference to get started. All right, let's go back to my Genesis 1.1 and see if this helps me. All right, Genesis 1.1. All right, read your passage. <laughs> Good. Read your passage several times in your preferred Bible version. As you read, use the highlight. All right, this is very helpful. It's showing you how to perform a basic Bible study. I like this, step by step. Um, and they say, read, yeah, start there, but then also branch out and read some other Bible translations. Yeah, mark any words or ideas that draw your attention. Fine. You could highlight things you want to look up later. Okay, I like that. Um, yes, desired explanation. Right. Okay, good. 
regen. Oh, and you could probably click on this to read it. And look, it's going to pull up the New Revised Standard Version. I don't want that Bible translation. All right. What questions? Oh, you could write down observations. Observations, so very important. I'm writing a book right now, and I'm going to be putting out an online course about how to study the Bible. And observations are the most important. I took um, a Bible study methods, hermeneutics, with Dr. Howard Hendricks at Dallas Theological Seminary. And we began the very first week of class making 50 obser or 25 observations on Acts 1.8. We brought the paper back the next week. He said, keep it, don't turn it in. Sign it for next week is another 25 observations on Acts 1.8. He said in class, he had one of his students compile all the observations that came in, and there's something like over 400 or 600 or something. I can't remember the exact number. But observations are so important for Bible study. So the more observations you have, the better. And then look at this. Read the passage in other translations. Yes, very helpful. Identify people. Yes, people, place, things, events, actions, nouns, verbs, who, what, where, when, why, how. Okay, all of these importance. Cross-references. Summarize your passage. Review commentary. Um, I would put that further down. Reviewing commentary in my study, and hopefully in your study, comes at near, nearly the very end of your study. In fact, after I've completed my study, have my conclusions, insights, what I want to teach, only then. I don't want to short-circuit what the Holy Spirit is trying to teach me, so I put the commentary research at the very end. Um, determine your passages, theological insights, apply the passages to yourself, share insights from your Bible study. Okay, look, overall, a very good outline for basic Bible study methods. I wonder, I think I saw one for more advanced there, too. Oh, no, it was just basic. Well, you could do expository sermon preparation. Let's just look at that one real quick. All right, let's going to go with, let's see how this is different. Genesis 1.1. Should be fairly similar to basic Bible study. And look, this ha they have this cool little thing over here. You can check off each step as you go. Begin with prayer. Yes, I do that. Reflect on your passage selection. Read your passage several times. Okay, that's very similar to Bible study, right? Identify possible themes, main idea. Okay, all of this is exactly what I do as I'm preparing my sermons and even my podcast teachings for the One Verse podcast. Study your passage. Yes, identify basic facts. This is observation. Again, read your passage, literary types. Okay. Uh, events, words, prepositional outlines, difficult to do. Very important step. It helps you understand the thought flow. Okay. Overall, I like this. Write and develop your sermon. I'll bet they have a way right here in Logos that you can do that. Prepare to preach. Overall, this looks like exactly what I was taught in seminary, and I pretty much agree with the overall structure and plan of attack here. Okay, so look, Logos Bible Software version 8 is out. Based on what I see here, I am a big fan. I think it is a great improvement over, over Logos 7. They have some great guides, and um, I do like, I'm just going through my review of Logos 7, I still do like paperback books more than digital, but I like the speed of digital over paperbacks. That's why I use Bible study software. It saves me I don't know, thousands of hours every year, I promise. Maybe not thousands, uh, hundreds at least. All right, so um, let's go down and look at the positives. Yes, vast array of resources. They have everything at Logos Bible Software, well, almost everything. They don't have my books, although I have talked with them about getting my books in there, and I think I even have a contract for them, um, but uh, I've never sent them the files, so that's my fault. Uh, Logos, if you really want to push me on that, then send me an email and maybe I can get you those files. Finally, it's been like four years since we've been talking about that. Okay, uh, there's an app for Oh, they do have apps. I'm on my PC right now. If you use uh, an iPhone or an Android or an iPad or something, then they have apps for that as well. Let's see. Create Yes, create your own study notes. Visual learning, I talked about all of that. Easy footnotes in your writing. Oh, I didn't, I didn't think about that. I'll bet they have kept that uh, with, with Logos Bible software. Let's just check real quick. Open up my word processor here. Go back to my software. And let's just look up Genesis 1.1 again. Uh, what I need is a commentary.
All right, I'm going to have to So let's just see. If I were just to copy and paste some of this. Genesis 1.1 says this. All right, now let's just see. Now I don't really know. Oh, it did. Look, it, it, it brought over all these footnotes as well, the same ones that were over there. So that's helpful. But that was just a copy and paste, and it already had some of these footnotes in there. Let's um, do a reading aloud. Okay, that's interesting. They have a reading aloud option now. Let's go to the Jonah and open this one. Let's see what happens if I just copy some out of this. Let's say, well, this is no longer, this is not in Jonah, but whatever. If I copy that, Oh, it did. It did footnote it. Okay, so I was wrong. The other footnote did go in, and then this one. So look at that, how quick and easy that is. No more typing in all of your footnotes. Such a wonderful option. Thank you, Logos, for that. Huge time saver. Okay, go back through. Audio books. Yeah, I saw some of that, and they even have, you can have the Bible read to you now. Online courses. Oh, yeah, there's online courses, my favorites are from NT Wright, and I've even linked to some of them on my website. Um, so over here on the right, now these are not Logos sermons, these are directly from NT Wright, but they are some of my favorite on online courses from NT Wright. Okay. Video and audio lessons, we saw some of that. Speeds up research. Look, I have all these positives. It looks to me like they all still apply. So, good job, Logos, with version 8. I am a uh, proud supporter of this Bible study software. It has saved me so much time in my research and teaching. And if I was making videos and stuff, I have been trying to make some videos for YouTube and Facebook. Maybe I will start trying to incorporate some of the visuals from Logos Bible software for that as well. Anyway, long story short, look, if you're a Bible student, if you study Scripture, you teach Scripture, I highly recommend you get Logos Bible Software. Version 8 is out today, October 29th, 2018. And again, if you go to redeeminggod.com slash logos, logos, however you want to say it, redeeminggod.com slash logos, it will take you to my special offer page over at Logos. Now, by way of full disclosure, they will give me a bit of um, a kickback, <laughs> okay? Uh, uh, I, I am an affiliate for them. I want to let you know that. And so if you do use this, please use the Redeeming God 8 coupon code, and then Logos is going to pay me a little bit. I honestly have no clue how much it is, all right? And I don't really care. I, I use this Bible study resources, and I recommend it. And so I want to give you some of the best tools that uh, help me and uh, which I think will help you as well. When you do use that coupon code, you're going to get 10% off the base package, 25% if you're upgrading from a previous version. And then you'll also get all of these free books. All right. There's a bunch of them here. At least I think it's all of them. Maybe one. Let First, choose your five free books. All right, so there's five you can pick from. Not all of them. Just had to read the, the page a little bit better. Five free books, and then um, you get your discount, okay? And then make sure you sign up for their email list because then you will be getting free books every month as well. All right, so I'm going to try. I'm gonna end the video here. What I'm going to do is go see if I can change my default search version. And if I'm able to do that, I will include a comment. <laughs> right beneath the video on how I finally was able to do that. Hopefully it's easy. All right. Uh, thanks for watching. And if you do get Logos Bible Software and you have comments or questions about it, let me know as well. I would be, I would love to hear them. Okay. Thanks. Talk to you later. Bye.